Good evening. So I'm going to be talking this evening about heart disease coming up to and in the elderly. Um, and uh, it's a subject which should affect all of us because firstly, we've all got hearts and the point where things come to an end is where those hearts stop. Uh, but the second thing is that the heart disease is still the single most important cause of mortality and morbidity here in the UK and in most developed countries. But this is part of an overall series which is looking at health at the extremes of life. Uh, last, the last lecture I gave was about health in the first 28 days of life, uh, and this is now at the other end, people as they're growing older. Now, the medical importance of the heart was not actually fully understood, uh, even in its most basic form, at the point when the benefactor of this college, Thomas Gresham, died. Uh, the seminal work of William Harvey, which demonstrated the circulation in the heart, actually occurred after that time. But the heart clearly was already seen to be important both uh, as a, a, an organ and uh, in terms of uh, spiritual and uh, other aspects, but in terms of actually as a pump which actually kept the body going, that was something which actually was in, lay in the future when this college uh, was, uh, was beginning. Over the last decades, heart disease has improved very substantially in the UK and in most of the developed, developed world. And as a result of this, and this is a slide which I showed in my introductory lecture because I think this puts it in context, the death rate for people in England and Wales, and the same is true uh, for the other countries in the United Kingdom, has steadily increased. And has increased in particular in men. So in this slide, what I've got uh, is comparing uh, 1968, around the time that I was born, uh, with around about now. And in that time, what you can see is that the, this bulge of mortality which occurred in the 50s and early 60s has steadily moved up. A lot of that is explained, as I'll come on to show, by changes in heart disease. And if you look specifically at cardiovascular disease, and cardiovascular disease in practice means heart disease and stroke, and ne the next lecture I give will be discussing stroke, um, what you see is that heart disease has steadily decreased since it peaked around uh, the 70s. So it has been on a steady downward trajectory, and cardiovascular disease two years ago, for the first time, actually moved to a position where the fewer people were dying of cardiovascular disease than of cancer. My prediction would be that this downward trajectory is going to continue. So heart disease will continue to be a significant problem for all of our lifetimes, but a decreasing one in most developed countries. And to be clear, this heart disease decrease is happening in all ages. These are data from the US, but they could be replicated in, in any direction. The uh, graph on the left uh, is looking at people under the age of 85, and the graph on the right is looking at people over the age of 85. Now, the starting point is much higher. This is rates per 100,000 of the population. And we start at different bases, but the point I'm making with this is this significant decrease is happening whatever age you are. This isn't, however, absolutely uniform across the whole of the world, across all social groups, or across the UK. And this is a map of the UK uh, in terms of the cardiovascular risk. And that, what you can see is red colours is basically bad news. Now, the, the reality is that up till this point in time, for many people, their heart was growing old a lot faster than they were. For some people, that is still true. What has been achieved over the last three decades is the ageing of the heart has in practice slowed right down, and in some cases been reversed, meaning that this doesn't, isn't a situation where this is the major limitation for many people it would have been previously. I'm not saying there isn't still a big problem with heart disease, there certainly is, but there is undoubtedly a significant improvement. And what causes this is a combination of different factors. They include your own genes, family history is very important in this, what you do, both as a job and what you eat and your exercise and a variety of other things will come on to in the end. Medical care, which ethnic group you come from. So, for example, in the UK, people of South Asian heritage 
have higher heart disease rates than people of Caucasian heritage overall. Clearly, there are variations around that. And also in public health and clinical care. And it is right, quite striking, for example, that we are now here in the, UK, in the city of London, in the UK, uh, the mortality rate here is 72 per 100,000 compared to the city of Glasgow, which is not the highest in the UK, actually, uh, which is 198 per 100,000. Very substantial differences. So it does matter what you do. If we now look at the burden of disease here in the UK, and these are recent data from the Chief Medical Officer, uh, the, this is the age-specific rate of mortality, and this thin line where almost nothing happens is what happens when you're a young adult, right up to your retirement age. Basically, mortality rate in that age group is now minimal. It then starts to increase a bit, and the light green bars are the cardiovascular risk. These are the ones we're going to be talking about today. And as you can see, they're increasingly becoming very heavily concentrated in terms of cardiovascular deaths in people in their 80s. Really quite late on in life compared to where they would have been. But this rate is going down in the UK and most developed countries. If we were talking about India or a number of other developing countries, Brazil, uh, which are increasing in terms of their wealth, on the other hand, the trajectory is going the other way. As infectious diseases decrease, the rate of heart disease in those countries is steadily increasing. Their problems are still in the future in terms of this. But, and this is very important, I think, it's not just deaths, but also severe disease, which is an issue here. In my first talk in this series, I pointed out that overall, we were in a situation where for every two years of life we were gaining in terms of length, we were only gaining one year of healthy life. This is a very serious problem for us as a society. But when it comes to heart disease, although there is uh, still a large burden of heart disease where people's lives are limited by it, in practice this has been also decreasing very substantially. And I've illustrated this here just as an example uh, with um, data on people being admitted to hospital. Now this is a very crude proxy for what actually happens. But what you see is there has been a steady downward trajectory in angina and in heart failure. When I was a medical student, really a very large proportion of any medical take would be made up of these two conditions. It's now a much smaller proportion in virtually any hospital in the UK as a result of a variety of things I'm going to go through now. And this is not just because healthcare in the round is getting better. For example, infectious diseases, because of an aging population, are going up over that time. So this is not a downward trajectory in every area. But it is the case that if you take people over the age of 75, at this point in time, uh, around 7.8% of men and around 5.9% of women have heart failure. And this quite limits their life. Now, and th at this point, uh, I'm going to, uh, if there are any cardiologists in the audience, you'll be appalled by the simplicity of the approach that I'm going to take. But in sen essentially, when it comes to uh, the heart, there are really only five things that can go wrong. And the good news is we have things to fix all of them. Not completely, but things are improving on each one of these things. It can go too slowly. It can go too fast. The valves can actually become inefficient, as with any pump. The coronary arteries get narrowed or blocked, meaning that the heart starts to malfunction, and cause pain, and be inefficient. And the heart muscle can fail for a number of other reasons. Those are the things which go wrong. All of these can lead to pump failure, which causes a variety of other problems in the body. And I'm the first half of this lecture, just like the over half, I'm going to go through each one of those and talk through how science has managed to improve every single one of these over the last 30 years. And the last third of the lecture, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the public health issues, uh, which are, I think, more complicated and which become more philosophical, because they're about trade-offs. They're not about science so much or, or entirely, but trade-offs uh, in terms of society. Let's start off with the heart going too slowly. Now, the heart may go too slowly all the time, meaning that someone has very considerable difficulties getting around, or it can go slowly from time to time. 
intermittent heart block of different sorts. And this means that someone can be walking along and then suddenly feel incredibly dizzy because their heart has slowed right down, making it very, very difficult for them to operate. There are a few causes of this which are entirely reversible, for, which are nothing to do with the heart directly. For example, if someone's got very low thyroid gland, uh, thyroid um, uh, in, in, uh, hormones, then that is going to lead to significant uh, concerns. Some drugs can cause this. So it can be something which is actually caused by medicine, in fact, quite frequently. And some of these are temporary effects. So, for example, people after operations or after serious infection might go into heart block, which they subsequently are not going to. A classic one is a very small heart attack can cause this, and then can write itself. But for many people, this, once this has started, this is not reversible, and this is permanent. Now, that used to be a very serious problem, but what has changed is uh, a, it's the, in, the implanting of now extraordinarily reliable pacemakers. It's a very simple in concept tool. Now the early pacemakers, I've chosen one from around about 1960, uh, were boxes like this. Uh, this clearly was not a major, this was clearly a major drag on your life if this was what you were going to have to do to solve your problems. But over time, what we've had is a revolution over the last 40 years in pacemaker design. They are now extremely small, for most people, you can hardly see them. They're very long-lasting. Usually, you don't have to change the batteries more than once every five to seven years, depending on which type they are. Uh, they're very reliable. You can program them without having, by just remotely, by things like magnets. Increasingly, you can program them, and even, you can sort of do things like interrogate them over the phone. You don't even know to go to the doctor. So the medical kit on this is improving the whole time. And the most important advance in the last few years has been what's called dual pacemakers, where you have a pacemaker wire on the top of your heart and you have a pacemaker wire on the bottom of your heart and those are synchronised. So now the pump is actually pumping once at the top and once at the bottom just as it should normally. This has significantly improved the quality of these pacemakers in terms of quality of life. So this advance uh, means that really people have had a real improvement in their lives if their problem is their heart is going too slowly. And in the UK, around 26,000 pacemakers are put in every year. The other rhythm problem is the heart may be going too fast. Again, it may be all the time, meaning that people's heart is pumping very inefficiently, they just can't do what they normally would expect to, or it can be intermittent. Again, they're absolutely fine walking along and then suddenly they get hit by this, become breathless, can't stand up, can't do things, feel faint, have falls which in elderly people is a very serious problem, even if they're relatively uh, intermittent. Again, there are, relative, there are a relatively large number of reversible causes. So this time round, too much thyroid activity can lead to the heart going too quickly, for example. And again, some drugs uh, can be associated. And again, sometimes it's temporary, either because it's just flipped into an odd rhythm in which case, either it'll get better, or sometimes you need to give a, short, a small shock across the heart that just bumps it back into its ordinary rhythm, but then it stays there, uh, or because you've had things like surgery uh, or an infection. But again, for a number of people, the heart, once it is going too fast, stays too fast unless you do something about it. You cannot reverse this completely. And now I move from medical physics into the first thing I'm going to do in terms of pharmacology. And actually, one of the earliest drugs that is still in use for the heart is digoxin. Uh, we in the UK claim this uh, as our own uh, due to a uh, publication by William Withering in 1785, an account of the foxglove and some of its medical uses with practical remarks on the dropsy, dropsy being an old name for uh, a form of heart failure. He, in turn, may have learnt about it, and this is slightly debated in the literature, uh, from Mother Hubbard, who was a more traditional healer uh, using uh, modern uh, nomenclature. And interestingly, this gave rise to a very significant uh, academic scrap between him and Erasmus Darwin, who tried to scoop him and essentially probably plagiarised him by reading a paper first in the Royal Society, an early uh, example of scientific bad behaviour. But this, um, uh, this drug uh, is an example and we'll come on to some the other way around, of a drug where we worked out, we the world, we the human race, worked out what it did 
well in advance of working out how it worked. So people just noticed this drug did the job, and then subsequently, it wasn't really until uh, the uh, 1970s uh, that we worked out how this drug worked. Now, this is probably for some of you going back to uh, O level or GCSE, but so stay with me if you're uh, if you're you're, uh, you're really absolutely on top of this. But in, in ordinarily, the heart contracts in two stages. There's a pacemaker, a natural pacemaker at the top of the heart that sends out a, a wave of uh, electricity that contracts the heart, and contr the top half contracts. Then there's a delay and then the bottom half contracts. That's the way the pump works. It's a pretty standard kind of pump design. Now, in atrial fibrillation, what happens is the top half of the heart stops being uh, contracting in any kind of serious, regular way. It contracts all over the place, and there are two effects of that. Firstly, you lose the benefit of the pump from the top of the pump. The top of the pump essentially stops working because it's chaotic. And the second is it drives the bottom of the heart far too fast generally, not always, but usually, far too fast to be efficient. And there's a very strong age component to this. So this is the rate of atrial fibrillation as you go through your years. And really, it's, it's very rare up till the end of your 50s. And then every decade that goes by, the rate of atrial fibrillation will just naturally increase. That's just, this is a natural fact in a sense of aging. But drugs can do two things, one of which I'm going to talk about in my next lecture, which is around stroke, because for uh, stroke, atrial fibrillation is one of the big risk factors. I'm not going to talk about that bit now. But in terms of the pump being efficient, uh, the key thing is to slow it down. And the oldest drug to do this is digoxin, which we talked about earlier. But the heart can go fast for quite a variety of other reasons, and you can f end up with uh, rogue pacemakers or rogue uh, pathways anywhere in the heart, which actually drives the heart far too fast. And one of the big surgical advances, semi or medical stroke surgical advances in the last 10 years, uh, 10 or more years, but 10 years in terms of widespread use, is what's called uh, ablation therapy. Ablation therapy, cardiologists go in, they find the bit of the heart that is overexcitable, and they just scar it up so that it no longer does the things it's been doing previously. In many people, where it's appropriate, this will provide them with a permanent fix for the heart going too quickly. They don't need drugs. This basically sorts the problem out. It's not appropriate for everyone, but it can be appropriate for a significant number. And I think one of the things which has not been done sufficiently yet uh, is that inevitably, and this happens with all new medical advances, people have started off by uh, trying it out in younger people. But the big burden of disease, in many ways, is in older people. And the average age at which this should be used will, I predict, over the next 10 years, gradually increase. But again, sometimes we can't fix things with surgery, and then we need drugs to slow things down. And there's quite a list. I'm not going to go through this, because this is not a major part of uh, what I think has led to the major increase in cardiovascular disease. But I would like to make one point about these. None of the drugs we have to slow things down are ideal. All of them have significant side effects, different ones for different drugs. And I think that this is one of the areas where there is significant scope for science to improve things over the next decades. My guess is someone giving the same talk in 20 years will probably be talking about a different set of drugs, or at least a successor set of drugs to these ones. Then we come on to valves failing. And again, valves can fail because they're too tight, and any of you who've got a tap at home will understand this, or too floppy. The old, the commonest cause of this in the days when infectious diseases is what drove our, our causes of mortality was what's called rheumatic fever. It was an effect of people getting streptococcal infections, often of their throat, and that went on to cause damage to the heart valves by an indirect means. Now, as infectious diseases have reduced as a major problem, widespread use of antibiotics, appropriate use of antibiotics, or the chief medical officer will be after me, uh, a variety of other things. But as things have improved on the infection side, the rheumatic fever as a cause of heart, heart uh, pump failure because of its damage to the uh, valves has essentially gone away. This is an extremely rare thing, except in very old people. And it's not because they're very old. It's because they're from the time when this was a common problem. So it's not they've had this problem since they were young. 
but the other causes of valvular heart disease increase with uh, age. And the first big advance on this has been in diagnosis. The diagnosis of heart uh, failure due to pump failure uh, is now extremely reliable and is non-invasive. It, doesn't, it involves people putting a probe uh, on the outside of the chest. And what this has come from, by a variety of indirect means, is two different lines of science, nothing to do with cardiology. One of which, indirectly, from observing bats and how they got about, was moved into sonar, and then into radar, and then into uh, ultrasound. So that, that, that was the kind of scientific pathway. And the other one, uh, was some very interesting theoretical work on what's called Doppler shifts, where if you're going in one direction, a wave is a different length than if you're going in the other direction. That means you can actually tell where the f how fast flow is. And so you now use Doppler probes, which combine ultrasound and Doppler, two totally different sciences, to allow you to accurately diagnose heart disease and know which ones need operation. And that can lead to people having uh, valve surgery, uh, and the treatment is still surgical. So it's mainly replacement of the valves, um, and the, there are, you know, under different circumstances, you may want metal or, uh, or artificial valves, or you may want uh, biological ones, which are mainly these, at the, at the moment, porcine valves. Uh, I'm not going to go into the surgery, although I'm happy to answer questions, mainly because the Gresham Professor of Physics is a cardiac surgeon. So I think you've probably got someone who's going to give you a lot of uh, work on this if you attend a lot of Gresham lectures. But I'm happy, as I say, to answer questions at the end. But the big numbers actually come from coronary artery disease. And in coronary artery disease, actually the first really major advance in mortality came from an old drug, not a, a, a drug probably that goes back, or does go back in terms of its uh, use in uh, traditional medical practice hundreds of years, uh, at least back to Hippocrates and probably back to the, uh, to the Egyptians. In the UK, it was systematized around about 1760. Uh, by one of the many uh, uh, men of theology who were also uh, good amateur scientists. And he promoted it over argue for Peruvian bark. Peruvian bark was what gave quinine, and he was giving it because he said it tasted like quinine, and quinine caused mal uh, cured malaria, and therefore this was a good alternative. Now, the logic was completely wrong, but actually, as a result of that, we ended up with a drug uh, which is uh, extremely effective in a variety of different ways, but its biggest use is actually now in cardiovascular disease. Uh, Bayer Company then developed this much more systematically from the uh, willow and various other plant extracts uh, into the drug we know as aspirin, which has been around for a long time now. Uh, it was not until, again, the 1970s that its actual, under, its actual mode of action was understood. Another drug where we work out what it does and then we work out how, we, how it does it. The opposite way around to, I think, a lot, the way a lot of people think science works. And its first trial in heart disease was in 1971. Until that point, uh, the major thing people tended to recommend was bed rest, which, incidentally, was probably absolutely the wrong thing to do. This was a revolution in heart disease. And I'm, this is a trial which was so important that I'm actually going to talk you through the trial, one trial. It happened just about the time that my, my generation of uh, medical students entered medical school, and it completely revolutionised our thinking about medicine. In 1988, a trial of around 17,000 people with an absolutely certain, or pretty well certain, heart attack based on ECG criteria were randomised in a trial to one of four arms. Ordinary treatment, do nothing. Aspirin, on its own. A clot-busting drug called streptokinase, for a long time very important, it's become less important subsequently, or both. And what this showed conclusively was that uh, you reduce mortality in heart attacks by 20% just by giving a single aspirin tablet. Quite extraordinary. A drug we'd had around for uh, the best part of 100 years and not used for this indication. If you gave the clot-busting drug, same kind of effect, and if you put the two together, you reduce mortality from heart attack by 40%. Just two drugs, 
ECG, give the drugs immediately, 40% reduction. Now, since that time, things have improved, and we've moved uh, from a situation where, at the end of that trial, the mortality was around 8% if you had a heart attack, so just, just under 1 in 10, to one where between 3 and 5% of people who have a heart attack will die now. So the improvements have continued and will continue, but this improvement was absolutely dramatic. And it proved two things. Old drugs can do amazing things. Don't, you don't have to choose new things. And secondly, uh, a, uh, a distinguished old professor, and they used to be old, and they used to be older even than me, with a pinstripe and a booming voice, could be wrong. <laughs> the key thing to do was to do trials. Because the people who were tra training me had told me categorically that bed rest, whatever it might be, was the useful thing to do. They did a trial. They were clearly wrong. So this was allowed us, by evidence, to demonstrate that we could actually improve things quite significant, as I say, with quite straightforward drugs. So aspirin has remained, and with it, other, and the, the way that the aspirin works in heart disease is in reducing the platelet bit of the clotting system. And other antiplatelet drugs have joined it, but aspirin remains a mainstay of heart disease uh, treatment. Streptokinase, the clot-busting drug, and things like it are still in use, but they're much less used because even more effective, if it's available now, uh, is what's called coronary angiography and stenting. And this can be used in emergencies and can be used in the cold light of day, but this is a situation where you use it in an emergency. And the idea of angiography is very straightforward, although very difficult to do. A cardiologist will put a wire with a balloon on it, either into your wrist or into your groin, then run it up your blood vessels into your heart, heart vessels, using dye to work out what's going on. And then they will uh, find the, the area of narrowing and they will blow up the balloon that's on the end of the wire. And around that balloon, there's a, there's a mesh. Traditionally, it's been a, wire, a kind of metal mesh. Increasingly, we're moving on to other things. And then you remove the balloon and you leave the mesh behind, opening it up physically. That simple, uh, I mean, simple conceptually, clearly, I would suspect none of you could do it. Uh, I certainly couldn't. Uh, but um, that simple conceptually uh, thing has made an enormous difference, both to our, our chances of dying from heart attacks, but also for people who've got ordinary angina. Because if you do this, when someone's got a narrowing of their blood vessel, you can transform their lives, increasing the power of the heart and reducing the pain that goes with angina, reducing their need for drugs. It's been a very transformational uh, approach. And the early uh, ones were largely metal ones, almost exclusively metal ones. Increasingly, there are more sophisticated meshes that you put on the end of your balloon. Increasingly, bio they are biodegradable, so you actually don't leave the mesh in place. And they're what's called drug eluting, where the drug stops overgrowth and a variety of other things, so that there's a drug in the stent, and the stent may well disappear. And these are improving the whole time. And this, uh, uh, this graph here, anything to the left of the line means things are improving. And this is what's happened essentially over time. Gradually, there is a steady, small, incremental, but compounding improvement in our ability to do this stenting so that the outcome for this is improving year on year. There still is a significant role for people to have cardiac surgery to bypass narrowings of the heart, the heart uh, blood vessels. Um, the uh, vasculature of the heart is complicated, but there are some major uh, vessels, and then there's quite a number of minor vessels. What the best thing to do uh, between putting the angiography, where you put the wire into the heart and then expand it, or whether you do bypass, where you basically just do some straightforward plumbing, you take either an artery from nearby or a vein from the leg, and you bypass, literally, uh, the blockage will depend on a number of factors, including how well the patient is and how many blockages they've got and where they are. It's a complicated decision. In some cases, it's really clear. In some cases, it's, it's rather more difficult. But there will always remain a place for cardiac surgery because for some people, this is better, certainly from the point of view of their chances of dying, than the angiography. But angiography is a much more minor procedure. A major bypass surgery is quite a major thing to undertake. Uh, and you clearly have to be moderately fit 
uh, to be able to face it uh, with some degree of confidence. And the result of that is that over time, actually the number of bypass surgeries has actually levelled off and is beginning to slightly decrease. It'll never stop. This isn't a complete replacement, but the number of angiographies has taken off. So this technology has transformed the lives of very large numbers of people and is likely to continue to. Alongside that, there have been a number of transformational drugs. And I'm only going to talk about uh, four of them. There's a very long list, but these are four of the ones that I think are most important. And I'm doing this partly just to explain the range of different types of drugs involved, but partly also to explain the range of different sciences involved. So we've had uh, the physical sciences, we've had medical physics, we've had surgery, we've had angiography and a variety of sciences. This is the role of pharmacology. And the first one to discuss is beta blockers, uh, which uh, quite probably a number of people on the audience will be on. Beta blockers are an extremely common drug now. Um, their job is to fight the natural process in the body, which is adrenaline, which is part of our fight and flight system. Adrenaline is what gives you drive when you want to run. You want to do a variety of other things. The problem is if your heart is failing, if you've got angina, that drive is actively unhelpful to your heart. It's driving it too fast, basically. Um, and uh, the basic science behind this was really known in the 1940s and 50s, uh, where we found that there were certain receptors for the adrenaline, which were different receptors in different bits of the, the uh, body. And then uh, James Black, uh, among other people uh, here in the UK, um, developed the first drug that could actually, was purposefully designed to block the receptor so the adrenaline could be released, but it wouldn't do its job. Now, this is the opposite way around to the aspirin, for example, we talked about earlier. This is a drug where we worked out the science and then designed the drug to deal with the science, rather than we found out how the drug worked and then worked out backwards uh, what its mode of action was. And beta blockers have continued now uh, to uh, develop, and there's now quite a range of beta blockers that do different things, which actually block different amounts of different sorts of receptors in the body in different ratios. The second one, which came by a slightly different route, uh, was the drug class called ACE inhibitors. This is a different system in the body, and this is where the kidney senses that blood pressure has dropped. And its response to this is to start a cascade of uh, reactions which are designed to push your blood pressure up. It's a perfectly sensible thing for the kidney to do, but again, in the context of a heart that is failing, this is problematic. It's actually indirectly telling the heart to do the wrong thing. So it's pushing the blood pressure up, it's driving the heart. So um, the first drug that, that was found to, or the first chemical peptide that was found to actually affect this uh, was isolated from the Brazilian pit, pit viper, which I've put here. Whoops. And this led, this wasn't possible to use orally, so this led by a whole series of chemical changes to a drug class, ACE inhibitors, uh, the first of which was a drug called Captopril, but there's now a very large number of ACE inhibitors, all of which do basically the same thing. They block this system by which the kidney triggers off a rise in blood pressure and a variety of other changes. And the third one uh, is a different um, uh, class called aldosterone antagonists, the one that most people have heard of is something called spironolactone, and this works directly in the kidney. The kidney does a very straightforward job uh, in one sense, it moves fluid from your blood out to your bladder, and along the way, it balances your salts and it reabsorbs water. That's its main job. So it flushes out toxins, rebalances salts, reabsorbs water. And uh, if you can use the problem with um, the, uh, again, this system, the aldosterone system, is again it reacts in a natural way, but a way which damages the heart. So the drug classes block this system in the kidney, and they lead to this kidney releasing, le letting sodium, which is one of the key salts, out of the kidney, which it wouldn't do normally, and water follows it. So those are three drugs, I could go on for more, but those are three drug classes which I think are important. And the reason they're important is this slide here. If you choose to take someone who's got heart failure, and you put them on these three drugs, the ACE inhibitor will reduce mortality 
for this person by around 25%, 26%, the beta blockers by around 34%, and the aldosterone by around uh, the aldosterone uh, drugs by around 30%. Put those together, and you significantly reduce the chance that someone who has actually got heart failure will go on to die. More importantly for them in many ways is their quality of life will substantially improve. Their exercise tolerance will get better. They'll feel less breathless. A whole variety of things which have been limiting their lives will improve. And digoxin, the old favourite, has gone in and out of fashion. It's currently in a we don't know, maybe yes, maybe no phase. Uh, but the four top drugs, there's absolutely no doubt that these are critical. So those are drugs which are really around cure, whether the heart has aged, things have happened as a result, and then you've needed the drugs to improve things. I'm now going to move on uh, to a few things which are around prevention. And here I want to differentiate between two different sorts of prevention, which in public health terms are is a really important differentiation. The first is what is called secondary prevention. And secondary prevention means someone's got heart disease, for example, and therefore you give them a drug to prevent further damage. So you know they've already got disease, and the aim is to stop it progressing further. And that's in comparison to primary prevention, where someone has not got a disease, and what you're trying to do is stop them getting it. Now, those, that difference is quite an important difference. Because if someone's got heart disease, you know for sure that there's someone who is liable to get heart disease. They're a high-risk group by definition. Whereas anyone else in the general population, you can risk stratify them, but you don't know for sure. So the difference between primary and secondary prevention is in quite important. Now let's start off with statins. Statins get into the news a lot, and in the next slide I'm just going to demonstrate a few of the more recent headlines. Uh, statins are a drug which undoubtedly lowers a form of cholesterol we know is associated with, with heart, heart disease, LDL cholesterol. There's no doubt it does that very well. Um, and uh, we know that LDL cholesterol goes up as you grow older and it causes more damage the older you are. That's physiology. We know that for a fact. There is overwhelming evidence that if you give these statin drugs to lower cholesterol to people who've got, already got heart disease, heart attacks, angina, cardiac failure, their outcomes will be a lot better. We know that for sure. There is no dispute about that at all. The difficulty comes in the people who do not get heart, heart disease. This is where all the debates tend to occur. This is, the, this is the primary prevention. The current UK guidelines on this have just changed to increase the indications for the number of people who do, currently do not have heart disease who are put on it from a 1 in 20 risk over the next 10 years to a 1 in 10 risk. Now, why is this? why am I raising this? It's because we're moving from a situation where it is absolutely clear, I as a doctor can say, without a shadow of a doubt, you will benefit from this drug, to one where I have to say, on the one hand and on the other hand, I think probably you're in the group who's going to be improved by this, but we're playing numbers here. Now, I, this is not helped by the fact that uh, the balance of risk argument is played out in the media in the way which is probably, I hope, not played out in your doctor's surgery. <laughs> And as you can see from these headlines, uh, whether you read the Sunday Express or the Daily Express, you either think that statins are a wonder drug or that they're appalling, uh, for example. Uh, in fact, uh, all of these statements are in one sense true. It depends who you give it to. The only statements I'd say were incorrect are these ones about beating cancer. But the, the cardiovascular ones are, in a sense, correct. And the reason that is the case is that there is a balance with these drugs between the risk of the drug or the side effects of the drug and the risk of not taking the drug, which is that you are actually going to get heart disease if you don't take it, or at least your risk of heart disease goes up. So it's about a proper risk assessment. And the reason why all of these are true is if, for example, uh, you, started, you gave people statins in their 20s, just for their 20s, the probability is it would have almost no effect because their risk is so small at that stage, even if you reduce their risk, you're reducing it from almost nothing to almost nothing. Clearly, the further you go towards getting older, the higher your pre-existing risk is, so a 10% reduction moves from a minimal risk to really quite a substantial risk reduction, even though the actual percentage reduction may look pretty similar. And broadly, 
the elderly are the group who are most at risk, so therefore they potentially stand to benefit most. And this would be true for most of these drugs. The problem is that the elderly are also tend to be the group who are on multiple other drugs and who may get more problems from side effects. So you're balancing always the side effects on the one hand against the drug benefits on the other. And whilst the, the benefit is overwhelming in the people who've had heart disease, it's a bit more nuanced in the people who have not. However, I think I will give my, uh, my overall view on this, which is that it is pretty clear that most people, once they've got to a certain point, have got a cholesterol above a certain cutoff and with any number of other risk factors, family history amongst them, will benefit, on average, from taking statins. Now, the difficulty we've had is that the data on which the side effect numbers are put together is not in the public domain in the way all of us would like. So what we're having to do is balance a certain advantage in terms of cardiovascular risk against a probable disadvantage in terms of side effects. It looks as if these drugs are pretty safe. The great majority of people take them without any problems at all. Those few people who do have them generally have relatively minor problems. A very small number have big problems. So overall, I think most doctors would say the risk benefit is still, once you reach a certain cutoff, clearly in favour of taking them. Nevertheless, you have to realise there's a trade-off. And the same is, to some extent, true of heart uh, blood pressure lowering drugs. A range of different blood pressure lowering drugs uh, work. But the thing about blood pressure lowering drugs is all of them have side effects, without exception. They're different side effects for different drugs. They all seem to work in terms of reducing blood pressure. It doesn't seem to matter which drug you take. The key thing is, how much do you reduce the blood pressure? So it's not the type of drug, it's how low can you get the blood pressure. But you're always doing so at a potential risk to the person that they're going to have at least some minor side effects. So you don't want to give these to people who don't need them. But very clearly, if you look at the treatment better or non-treatment better, with the line being here, the benefits of taking heart disease, uh, blood pressure lowering drugs, are pretty clear, actually. So the question should actually be, if I don't tolerate this blood pressure lowering drug, then I should swap onto another one which I tolerate better. I still need to get my blood pressure down. So the fact that the different drugs actually all work basically equally effectively is reassuring. It means you can swap around classes because something that suits one person may not suit another. And if you look at blood pressure, what you find is that uh, there is an absolute, there's basically a linear reduction in risk if you pool all the risks where the, lower, the, the bigger the blood pressure reduction you get, the bigger the benefit you will see. The blue ones are heart disease, the dotted lines are stroke, and we'll come on to that uh, at the next um, talk. So reducing your blood pressure as low as you can tolerate it is very good for your heart. The longer you can have it, the lower it can be, the, the more you can tolerate the drugs, the better. Reducing statins, very good for your heart, but what you've got to do is you've got to trade that against the fact you've got to take pills, which people don't like, uh, and the downsides uh, of uh, potential side effects. So the result of this is the prescriptions used to prevent uh, these diseases has incre have increased steadily, uh, the antiplatelet drugs, the antihypertensive drugs, the lipid-lowering drugs, over the last 20 years. And a very large proportion of the reduction in cardiovascular mortality we've seen is due to people taking these drugs to prevent either as secondary prevention or as primary prevention. But it's not all about what doctors can do, or at least not in terms of drugs you can hand out. And I'm just going to highlight three things, one of which is really clear, one of which is slightly complicated, and one of which is very complicated. Really clear smoking. A single cigarette is bad for you. Single cigarette. Everyone above that is worse. That's the bottom line. <laughs> This is the classic study which demonstrated the link. It's in male doctors. It's the, uh, it's the Doll and Pito study. It's a very famous study. Uh, and they were followed up. Because they were followed up for decades, it's possible to follow them right up into the end of 100 years of age. And this is basically modelling out. And what they found was if you compared smokers to non-smokers, there was a 10-year age gap. This is an employed male British doctors, a very, very similar group. Smoking seriously damages your health. And a large proportion of that is cardiovascular. Slightly better news, 
They also modelled out what happened when people finished stop smoking at various points around their lives. And what they found was, if you stopped smoking in your uh, 40s, your risk actually was essentially as close to non-smokers as makes no difference. If you got down to you stopped smoking in your uh, 50s or 60s, then you would halve the risk compared to people who actually carried on smoking. You never quite got back to where you were before. It's never too late to stop, would be my summary of that. And fortunately, that is what has happened in the UK. Much to the uh, pain and against the very strong lobbying of the tobacco industry, uh, smoking rates are going down steadily in the UK uh, by incremental steps. Sadly, they're going up, however, in very middle, many middle-income countries, including countries which have got very high risk of cardiovascular disease and will have more. So this is a serious global public health problem, but we're beginning to turn the corner, I think, in terms of the UK. And a lot of that reduction in mortality uh, that I showed you right at the beginning is explained by this reduction in smoking. This single intervention, probably the most important public health intervention in the last 30 years, in terms of general public health intervention. And if you want to see how quickly this effect is seen, here is a recent study uh, from uh, people where the people have had just a ban on smoking in public places. It isn't banning smoking, it's just banning smoking in public places. Here's what happened in Liverpool. That's in a matter of weeks. That's because smoking does two things to your cardiovascular system. It actually causes furring up of the arteries, but it also causes the blood to become stickier. And that effect is reversed the minute, basically, you stop, almost the minute you stop smoking. So that was, that's the easy one. There's no doubt that has to happen. The only question is, how do we actually make it stick? Next down, slightly more difficult, reductions in salt. Salt drives your blood pressure. Far better to eat less salt and not have to take drugs quite as early than eat lots of salt and have to rever reverse the effects of that by taking drugs which give you side effects. So I think yeah, that would be fairly logical. The problem we have is that up to 75% of the salt you take, you have no idea you're taking at all. It's been put into the food you take, you have no choice about it, you just have to eat it. It's in your bread, it's in your cooked meals, it's in everything, it's basically, it's there. And the reason that's important is there's something called the Rose Hypothesis. And the Rose Hypothesis says, look, there are two ways you can deal with hypertension. You can either take the people on the extreme right of this curve, you find all the people you call hypertensive, and you stick them on drugs. Or you take the whole population and you move it slightly to the left by reducing the amount of salt they eat, and therefore the overall blood pressure goes down. Actually, if you do the numbers, that is a more effective thing to do. That has a bigger impact on the population's heart disease than actually finding the people who are hypertensive and sticking them on drugs. So how we do this is a really difficult issue in terms of public policy. We could put a salt tax on. Now, salt tax wasn't good for uh, British, British relations with India when we were uh, linked, linked together. A salt tax would undoubtedly be extraordinarily politically unpopular. It would uh, undoubtedly lead to uh, people talking about nanny states uh, and a whole variety of other things. And these are perfectly legitimate arguments. Yet a salt tax would be one way you could reduce uh, salt. I don't think it's particularly an efficient one. What we've tended to go for uh, is a, an agreement with the, with the food manufacturers, the responsible food manufacturers, that incrementally they have reduced salt in the prepared meals that they produce. And they've done so sufficiently slowly that it's happened to all of you and none of you have noticed. If they'd suddenly reduced salt by 10% from one day to the next, you would probably go say, right, I'm leaving M&S and going to Tesco's or vice versa. But because it's been done so gradually, no one's noticed and it's been possible to drift them down. But very large portions of the, popula of the population are eating food which are not from responsible manufacturers. Large amounts of processed food has got salt. They have no choice. People say freedom of choice. They have no choice. This salt is in the food. They have no choice about eating it. They're not adding it themselves. And this is a serious problem. We have not yet sorted this one out. We certainly could improve it. And then, uh, finally, we move on to exercise, better diet, reducing obesity. This is about individual decisions. Everybody knows it's a good idea. I, don't, I doubt any of you doubt that exercise is good for your heart. And yet, very many of you will not do anywhere near the exercise that you probably should. You will eat more, 
and more of the kinds of things you know are bad for you, you know, you'll be tucking into that delicious cream pie and then you know, lounging around, chatting to your friends, uh, when you should be doing this. <laughs> so how you tilt the deck so that individuals find it easier to exercise in a way that's sociable, in a way that works for them, rather than making it a penance, is something we've really got to work through. And it's quite interesting seeing how other groups, societies do it. For example, if you go to China, watching all the elderly ladies dancing and doing Tai Chi, they're clearly really enjoying it, and yet they're doing exercise in a very social way. So there are ways I think we could be more imaginative rather than finger-wagging and saying, please run more, because most people are not going to, frankly. So these questions about how we persuade people to do things healthily in a way that works for them and isn't a penance is, I think, one of the big challenges of public health, and particularly for the elderly. People forget that a relatively moderate amount of exercise, a 20-minute walk, for example, is enough significantly to reduce their chance of heart disease and heart disease progressing. So it doesn't have to... We're not talking here about marathons. We're talking about manageable amounts of exercise. So this lecture is consider the ways we can slow or reverse the heart. It can go too slowly. We can now do something about that. It can go too fast. We can do something about that too, although I think improvements are needed. The valves can become inefficient, and that is going to be an increasing problem. We have solutions to that. They're not perfect. The coronary arteries can get blocked or narrowed. We definitely can do things to reduce the effects of that, but clearly the most important thing is to try and prevent it happening in the first place and there are trade-offs in that, and the muscle can fail for other reasons, and we have drugs which can reverse the effects of that whilst not winding the clock back completely. So my final slide. The improvements in the heart are a relative, considerable success story for the elderly. People are getting older, but their heart is ageing much more slowly than it did 30 years ago. So they're entering old age with a heart that is younger than it would have been on average 30 years ago. That is a fantastic achievement. And many of the effects of ageing we can reverse, not completely, but enough for people to function uh, in a day-to-day -day way using drugs and techniques that were not available 30 years ago. And this trend is likely to continue. So whilst heart disease will remain one of the major causes of death and uh, bad quality of life in the UK, the proportion is steadily, in my, my view, going to go down uh, over the next uh, 20 years. In middle-income countries, unfortunately, it's on its way up. And uh, if I could do one single thing, stopping the increase in smoking in many of these countries would probably be that thing. It's an appalling situation. One of the problems we have is that elderly people benefit most from cardiac interventions, but they also tend to have the most side effects. And that trade-off is often not fully understood. And people often have multiple conditions with multiple drugs, not really, where basically there's a program we all agree on, the cardiac drugs they should have, and there's a program for the rheumatology drugs they should have, and there's a program they should have for the prostate drugs they should have. And actually, you end up with an 80-year-old person taking 25 drugs, and we don't really know how they interact. That's a problem. We haven't really thought that one through, I don't think. Far too many trials completely exclude the elderly. They have historically. And given that most people who can have serious disease are elderly, that's a problem. And we will pay a very heavy price in cardiac disease in the elderly because we have been, and in my view still are, too timid in our public health interventions. Thank you very much. <laughs>